I work with in Parliament, it takes the, the normal perception that science is a collaborative effort where we bring people together with a common goal. And the useful thing in science is we have a common language. We know how we want to achieve research. We know what the scientific method is. And so science allows a baseline for researchers to act in commonality towards a single goal, which might be discovery or it might be a cure for cancer or something like that. And so to take that one step further, um, the diplomacy part means that you've effectively got this soft power where you can take that common language of science and it doesn't actually matter which country you're working on, in. And we've found certainly within Parliament, when we're talking about science advice, we're talking advice for both us, but also our European partners, many of our partners in South America, the US, all over the world because we're all trying to achieve the same goal, which is evidence-informed policy making. We've also found um, that science diplomacy can get around barriers that may be there for political purposes. So there's lots and lots of good work, for example, happening between the UK and Russia on areas around Arctic exploration, Antarctic research. And that kind of work continues apace, regardless of where countries in other diplomatic realms might be. So science diplomacy is one of these things that just continues to cut through. It means that scientists work together regardless of their nationalities or anything else. Yeah. And from your professional uh, experience, can you give me an example in which uh, science diplomacy has been used as a uh, link of collaboration of countries and people? I, I can say with two hats. One is, you know, as an academic myself, I've worked in many different countries. So I spent a number of years working in Saudi Arabia, where you can use science diplomacy to bring together in one university 180 different nationalities all working together on science in a country that is, doesn't traditionally have that number of nationalities working together in higher education. So. That is one example of how you can use science to bring people together with a common goal. Another example is I'm a professor of global health and global health is all about trying to make sure that we're working in partnership across the globe uh, to benefit people on the ground, but also at a national and a supranational level. And many of the goals that countries have, many of the individual targets that people have for their lives are the same regardless of what country you work in. So again by taking that health message and working with it you can work in partnership across different countries and the sustainable development goals are a great example of that. You can come up with key areas that all countries want to achieve. Any challenge that you can see for science diplomacy as a tool probably for I think there's, there's always the recognition that politics might get in the way in some way. Um, and usually that often comes down to questions of bureaucracy. So countries might be quite protective over some of their work. So, for example, um, something I used to run into in my research was during the influenza H5N1 outbreak in Indonesia, Lots of scientists went over there, gathered samples, took them back to the US and <coughs> Europe and things, um, and did research, but not in collaboration with people in Indonesia. And that meant that Indonesia put in lots and lots of safeguards around exp export of materials, preventing RNA and viruses from going out of the country, and then that scuppers global health activities when you want to do rapid diagnosis. So you know, there, there's a number of things. One is to constantly be cognizant that you need to work in partnership with countries. You don't go into a country, do research, take it out, publish. It should always be co-production. The other is thinking about cultural and language barriers. And often knowing the language of a country or working closely with social scientists, anthropologists to understand the cultural aspects will help you develop a much more deeper, meaningful relationship and also, it's one of these great examples where personal connections always trump anything else. So there might be political tensions between countries, but if you've got friendships between scientists and collaborative work going on, that will probably continue apace, regardless of other tensions going on. What would you advise, or probably what 
what science, which things scientists need to do just to be able to probably understand that that importance of collaboration. So, in your opinion, yeah, what what they need to do. Yeah, so a lot of this, there's a lot of focus nowadays on knowledge exchange or knowledge mobilization, which is this movement of what we're doing in the research world into the policy world. So my background, so I originally trained in medicine, um, and then I did a PhD in genomics. I specialized as a medical microbiologist, and I spent five years as an academic in Sydney um, in global health. But during that time, I actually undertook a fellowship under the NHS Medical Directors Program in the UK. And that meant that I had the opportunity to work for a year with the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, based in London. And that was my first experience of seeing policy in action. So seeing that you can take your scientific, your medical knowledge, and you can use it in ways such as clinical guideline development, technology assessment of drugs, health economics, all of these questions that need to feed in to policy making later on. And after working in global health for a number of years, I realized actually the best way to have an impact is to work at that nexus between research and policy. And part of that role is a bit of a translator. But I do think there's a big push now for academics to learn some of these skills much earlier on. And you know, there's three big skills that you need as an academic. There's the traditional research and being able to write up your publication so that process of scientific discovery from hypothesis through to publication. But there's also the public engagement. So you know, ultimately, the public generally funds your work. So how do you give back? How do you explain your findings to the public? How do you help them understand science? And then the third is how do you do that for policymakers as well? And those, particularly those last two skills, are quite interlinked. So increasingly universities are working on communication skills and thinking how do you write for different audiences? How do you make sure that you can explain very complex details to a very wide number of people? Uh, is there uh, a new understanding of these scientific, uh, international scientific collaborations? Or, um, yeah, or how is it, how is it changed? Uh, through, through time? I, it's a good question. I think there, there's obviously more and more international funders of research. Mm -hmm. So the Wellcome Trust in the UK would be an example where they actively fund research both in countries like Vietnam but also within the UK. You've got um, other funders like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that tries to partner up different institutions. So you have that immediately has more of a supranational effect. The, the other thing is we have identified common goals that researchers can work towards. So the sustainable development goals are very much like that. And you can compare that to the Millennium Development Goals, which are much more focused on developing countries um, trying to meet those. Sustainable Development Goals, every country in the world has challenges to meet those. And it me means that there's much more of a a, a coherent effort across countries to do research, not just in the basic research and the translational research, but things like implementation science, things like social sciences, behavior change, all of those aspects that you'll need to do to actually achieve the SDGs. Yeah, and any probably generational uh, or a difference um, based on age in this, in this understanding? There probably is. It's, you know, it's always hard to generalise, but most of us have grown up in our university careers um, in very international universities. Um, we've often done PhDs in different countries. Um, Generation X and Generation Y are very mobile populations, particularly Generation Y, so they're much more likely to move country and do research in other places. So you have that kind of differences to your identity. But also, as you, as you say, things like social media really break down those barriers. So we're much, I feel we're much more aware nowadays of work happening regardless of what country it's actually happening in. Yeah. And how Shaping Horizons uh, fits in, in all this, in, in your opinion? Shaping Horizons is great because it's identifying for early career researchers the next steps on for their career. So, you know, traditional academic research was all about, you know, that kind of stepwise progression from 
being a researcher to being a senior lecturer to being a reader and professor and going up the ranks based very much just on your publications really and what discoveries you made on the way. What I find is early career researchers get that their research needs to have impact. So it's not just impact at the very long chain somewhere in the distant future, but it's everything that you do can have some kind of impact on society, whether that's through public education, whether it's through helping policymakers understand what needs to happen within a country. And my, my feeling when I go around the country is early career researchers get that. Um, they see their role in that and they're very willing to do it. They're willing to pick up these additional skills in order to communicate their findings and much more willing to work with the public and policy makers. So Shape and Horizons is great because it's, it's building upon that recognition that early career researchers now have. Thank you. Um, the last question, um, what does Shaping Horizons uh, means for you in a more personal probably opinion and yeah what do you see uh, for shaping horizons in the in the future i it one of the key things for me is mentorship so making sure that you are given advice and being able to set an example for younger researchers to work out what they want to do in their research career make sure that people know that it's the the roles out there for you with a PhD doesn't just mean you're going to be doing research for the rest of your life and there's this huge number of opportunities that you can have in order to change the world and I don't actually say that facetiously I think a lot of people can use their skills to the betterment and actually achieve the SDGs so I think the this focus on mentorship and bringing together external experts people that have you know, manage to get a bit further on this pathway to th then come back and tell young researchers how they actually went about doing it is fantastic. And I, you know, I can only applaud that you continue to do that in the future. Okay, thank you very much. That's my pleasure.